I'm going to go on to the next section on modeling fundamentals. We're just going to cover a, a few items here. And we'll start with the definition of a model. So let's start with this first definition. A, a, it's, a, it's a definition from the Department, U.S. Department of Defense back in 1994. I, frankly, I don't think it's changed much over the years. I think it's still roughly the same. But it's a physical, mathematical, or otherwise logical representation of a system, an entity, a phenomena, or a process. A physical, mathematical, or otherwise logical representation of a system, an entity, a phenomena, or a process. Okay. There's a couple other definitions here. Uh, next one, a representation of one or more concepts that may be realized in the physical world. Or a simplified representation of a system at some particular point in time or space intended to promote understanding of the real system. There are many other definitions, but what you see in common with these three definitions, as well as the many other definitions, is that term representation. I think that's at the heart of model. A model is a representation of a thing. And when it comes to engineering models, we're typically talking about representing the thing we're trying to design and build in the real world. I mean, that's our typical application. But in almost all cases, a, you can think of a model as just a representation of a thing. There are many different kinds of models, and as we look at this next slide, which shows a simple taxonomy of models, we can start to see the different kinds of models, some having different purposes or addressing different aspects of the system that's being represented. So let's look at the top, at, the, at that second layer there. That you see a physical mock-up? Well, what is that? That would be like uh, literally a mock-up that you would put in a wind tunnel, for example, to analyze aerodynamic characteristics of your system. It's a representation of the real thing. It's not the real thing. It's a representation of the real thing. It happens to be physical in nature. Our interest here is more on the computer interpretable models that is shown to the right. And if you look at the different kinds of computer interpretable models, you can classify those in the way shown here. There are probably many other ways you can classify them. This is just one. But we see the geometric representation. We see a quantitative representation and a logical representation. The geometric representation would be a typical 3D geometric model of your system. Where I think most, any engineer would be familiar with that. And uh, even non-engineers are pretty familiar with a geometric model. Uh, very sophisticated models, uh, very complex, and they've evolved from drawings back in the 80s to 2D uh, models in the, in the 90s and, and 3D models today. Uh, and and the, what they're able to do with those 3D models is pretty amazing. There's quantitative models. These are analytical models that solve equations and produce numerical results. So we all know, and there are a host of different analytical models that span many different disciplines from structures to reliability to you know performance. There's just many different types of analytical models. And then this third category is what's called a logical model. This is my term, um, although it was used in, the def in that DOD definition. But this basically defines logical relationships amongst the elements of the system. I'm going to go into more detail on this logical model in, in just a moment, moment, but let's first start with a simple illustration. Let's go down a level to a particular domain, in this case the electrical domain, and look at the geometric model, the quantitative model, and the logical model. A, in the electrical domain, a geometric model may be a circuit layout, so that would talk about the placement of parts on a circuit board. That's strictly, you know, pretty much geometry. It's positioning of things. 
Uh, a quantitative model would do some form of circuit analysis, like a sneak circuit analysis or some other analysis that you might do in the electrical domain. The logical model shown here is a wiring interconnection model, pin to pin. If you think about it, in and of itself, it's not ge geometric. It's just saying pin A to pin B on, in different connectors. And it's not quantitative. It doesn't really produce numerical results. So it's what I'm using the term logical. It's a logical model. And what, what is obvious from this is a logical model is critically important along with the geometric model, along with the quantitative model. In system engineering, this logical model has been used for many years, but it hasn't been formalized. And so what we try to do with SysML and, and other modeling languages is to formalize this logical model. And we'll talk about that in this next section. So that becomes a focus, this logical model. So a system model then is used to specify a system and capture these logical relationships. And it's capturing relationships amongst requirements, amongst design elements, analysis elements, and verification elements. So it's talking about all these different relationships. They're not necessarily geometric. They're not necessarily per se an analytic. They're logical by, by my terminology. And it's different than an analytical model, which performs computation. The, icon you see on the right hand side here is a SysML icon and it represents the four pillars of SysML which are structure, behavior, requirements, and parametrics and all of the relationships between, within them and between them. And as you learn SysML you get an understanding of what all those relationships are. So that's what a system model is. Let's talk about the value of a system model and maybe elaborate on what a system model is a little bit more. So first of all, this system model, capturing all these logical relationships between the different elements, it helps us manage complexity and risk. It captures very rich set of information which we'll begin to illustrate. It can encompass many different levels of abstraction while still being in a single unified model. Similarly, you can present multiple views of your system from this one model. You can look at it from a, a functional perspective or a physical perspective or a requirements perspective. And it does enable the use of patterns and promotes reuse if used properly. You can use the model, the system model, to help enforce rigor. You can do certain kinds of model checking. You can generate audits and reports. And so it's a very powerful mechanism for that. And finally, it provides a consistent definition of the system that is, can be used to integrate across all those different disciplines. It's that shared understanding. Let's look at a very simplest model. Here we see uh, an example of a SysML model where you see this block whose name is A and a block whose name is B and, and another block named C and a relationship between A, B, and C. So think of block A as your system. Think of block B and C as two subsystems. And what this model says is that block A is composed of B and block A is composed of C. So you're defining the decomposition of your system. And the beauty is you can say this one time in your model and everybody can use it and have access to it. What else does this model say? It says block A has a mass, block B has a mass, and block C has a mass. Well, this is obviously trivial. 
but you can add all different types of characteristics to these elements to your system and its subsystems and its components. So you can begin to elaborate all of the different elements of your system in this way. And in fact, add many other features. For example, you could talk about the functions that A performs, the functions that B and C perform, and, and other aspects of the system. So this is one view of the system. And the composition relationship that I described is actually what I would refer to as a logical relationship. It's not quantitative. It's not geometric. It's just logical. It's a logical statement about your system. This figure shows that block that B is connected to C through these ports, those little rectangles on the boundary. So this is a different view of the very same system that's shown above. So this is, this in effect is two different views of the same model that are completely self-consistent. They're talking about the same B, the same C, the same A uh, in both. But you can see that we're sharing different information in the different views. So the idea behind a system model is that you can create this model of your system, but you can present the data in different views to express different aspects of your system. Again, whether it's views of the structure, the physical aspect of it, or functional aspect of it, or requirements aspect of it, there are all these different aspects that you can bring out in this system model. So how do we use that system model? Well, we use it as we talked about up front when we talked about flow down and, and for that matter flow up. And so in this you know, highly simplified example of system specification and design, what you see are different modeling artifacts that we use as we progress through this, if you will, flow down process. At the top level, at the mission level, you often start with use cases and talk about what are the goals of the system. And here you see our system and you see the external system and the user. This is this black box view, one of them. And then you see uh, at this next level, you see the system composed of various subsystems. And you see at a lower level, you see, for example, and again, these, these artifacts are used at each level, but just highlighting them here. You see the sub, one of the subsystems is composed of these three components and they're connected in a particular way and they have flows between them. And then at the component level, you see, for example, that component block on the left uh, with a couple of key attributes uh, or called value properties. And you see the, a state machine for the component and you see the requirements for that component. So these are the kinds of artifacts that are generated actually throughout the entire process as you flow your system specification and design from mission to system to subsystem to component. And then these become ultimately specifications that designers design to. And then you move back up the V through the integration and verification process that we, talk, that we spoke about earlier. Having a system model is critically important. It really can help you in all the ways we've talked about, bringing all this data together in a cohesive way. Consistent, traceable, and complete system design. That's the goal of this system model. But to truly get value, you want to interconnect this system model with all the other models and data sources that that are used throughout the development process. So this just highlights that. You can see the, the tie-in between the system model and, for example, mechanical design models, uh, electrical CAE models, software design models, testing models, uh, your requirements management system up there in the upper left, uh, your analytical models on the right, uh, your, your documentation and reporting over there on the left. So what you see is that the system model 
along with all the other digital data for digital engineering, is requires a total ecosystem to bring all of this information together. This is done in a large part through standards. Uh, we rely heavily on standards to get this interconnectivity. Uh, and so modeling standards, data interchange standards, and the like are really key to achieving this uh, integration that you see here and getting the real value of model-based system engineering in a digital engineering context. So I just mentioned this digital engineering ecosystem and, and I've emphasized the need to manage this technical data as it moves across the life cycle. So here in this figure you see a simplified view of a product lifecycle management environment along with a simulation data management environment that manages the data as you move through the life cycle. I mentioned that governance approach in the earlier MBE 2B state slide. So here you see this product lifecycle management simulation data management core that's used to manage the data and then the various models and tools that are connected to this PLM environment so that this data can be managed. So you see the system model, the CAD model, the CAE model, the software model. You see all the different analysis models. And then you see the project management coupled in with the workflow and taking that data and, and managing, for example, the approval processes. Artifacts move from uh, being designed to being reviewed and approved. And that process is, is critical. And then getting it, like I said, having this managed across the entire life cycle. This is just a critically important aspect of the model-based engineering approach. I've also included on this one slide some of the additional data that you'll get from the system model that it brings out that you don't necessarily get from the other models. For example, the requirements uh, often come from a requirements management tool, but they're brought in to the system model and then traced to other parts of the design and to test cases and the like. Uh, the ability to capture logical components, these are abstraction of your physical components. Uh, capturing function and behavior and interface and interconnections across the entire system, not just mechanical interfaces and electrical interfaces, but software, mechanical, electrical, etc. Technical performance measures, traceability, things about your environment, your external systems. All of this is the kind of data that the system model brings in to augment the more detailed design data that you get uh, in the other uh, tools and models.